uh, after the uh, current popularity of Lincoln, that in 2013, William Henry Harrison will enjoy a, a huge vogue. Uh, actually, it, it, it's not my prediction, it's my hope that in 2013, uh, uh, we'll finally learn the lesson inherent in the debt session that we're mired in and begin to think uh, it, it, of uh, time, it, it, not, not in these, uh, not according to uh, our d diminished attention spans uh, or not according to the quarterly stock report, but uh, in, in, in a measure that, uh, uh, that, that means something. That's, uh, but that's only my hope. I don't predict that will happen. I can't tell you. Thank you. And uh, next, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, DJ Spooky, also known as Paul Miller. Uh, Paul's the executive director of Origin Magazine. He's a composer, multimedia artist, editor, and author. Uh, his DJ Mixer iPad app has been uh, downloaded more than 12 million times in the last year alone. And Paul's currently serving as the first artist in residence at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York. Paul? Um, it's a real pleasure to, to uh, share the stage with Larry. I'm a, a huge fan. And um, so what I'm going to do is a little bit of uh, non-linear engagement after post, you know, going on after Larry is like going on after, um, you know, if you're an economist, going on after, I don't know, John Kenneth Galbraith or something. Um, okay, so here's my prediction. What we saw in the last election is that one side of the political discourse, the, the Republicans, they don't do the math, you know. So... Um, I'm predicting that mathematics is going to have to be internalized for the Republicans to ever have relevance um, ever again. Um, so it's kind of a situation where, you know, one of my favorite writers, William Gibson, has a great phrase where he says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So, um, you know, it's 2013, to, you know, for us next year, but the Mayans had another calendar. And don't forget, even the Romans, if you think about emperor, when emperor changed September, you know, which used to be the seventh month, so that's why it's seven, sept. Uh, now it's the ninth month, you know, so we can remix everything. Um, so my prediction is that essentially the world become more nonlinear and we're going to enjoy it. There we go. We're here to talk about social movements. Is my mic on? Yeah. Okay, great. We're here to talk about social movements. And um, the last few years has really seen, uh, it's been a flowering of social movements. I think that uh, 10 years ago or a little more than that, maybe pre-9-11, there was this idea that people were apathetic. They just wanted to enjoy uh, their affluence and that there wasn't, a, there wasn't a real force behind any uh, social change. Well, in the last five years, we've seen two big ones from two opposite sides. First, we had the Tea Party movement come out of the uh, early years of the Obama administration, and then perhaps as a response or as a response to the crisis we had, of course, Occupy Wall Street. Um, at the same time, uh, the Tea Party movement is seen as, uh, as, as a, maybe a fading force or a weaker force on the right, and Occupy Wall Street's one-year anniversary just came and went very quietly. Mm -hmm. I wonder if both of you have thought about those two currents and what they can teach us about social movements going forward. You want to start? Well, okay. Um, first and foremost, I have to admit, I'm a liberal with a capital L, and I firmly believe in human rights, women's choice, and the fact that most Republicans are really annoying right now. Um, so the problem with social movements, and the good thing about places like moveon.org or avaz.org, is that you can see these kind of movements as catalyzers. And I think it's really important to realize the right wing studied what the left had done in the 60s. In fact, they, there are certain uh, manifestos and writings that they were even citing as some of their key documents. Um, the good news is that they seem to have overplayed their hand. I'm sorry, Ann Coulter was never interesting and never will be to me. Um, and the, the fun part about that is that places like Burning Man are building a lot more cultural capital now. Um, and I'm hoping to see um, a lot more of the people who actually won the culture wars, which is people who believe in human rights, women's choice, gay marriage, and all, this, all these things that would make normal Tea Party people burst into flames. Great. Larry, uh, you live on the other coast. You're in San Francisco, right? And um, things were different. Uh, we had Occupy Oakland, which had a different trajectory and a different feel than Occupy Wall Street here in New York. What's your view on, on the last few years of social movements? Well, I think you're right. Occupy, the Occupy movement and the Tea Party 
movement have, have, were reactive and both have, have uh, uh, fizzled away. Um, uh, well, that's my view. Uh, uh, you know, I saw what happened in, in Oakland with Occupy. They, they, well, you know, they, they, the, 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 the Occupy's problem was that they understood consensus uh, to a fault, uh, uh, to the degree it became a degradation of the democratic dogma, uh, uh, and, 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 and then you couldn't come up with a mature way to deal with, 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 with create discourse within their ranks so that they could create a coherent set of ideals that then would, but to do that you have to conceive there's such a thing as hierarchy and it's not necessarily hegemonous or patriarchal or evil. <laughs> what can we learn from Burning Man? It's a, it's a massive gathering. Um, we have this concept of sort of spontaneous order. Sometimes you don't necessarily need a formal pecking order, but you will, out of a crowd, if the right conditions are present, get, uh, get rules and get order. And, and Burning Man, despite its size, despite its distant location, um, is said to be very well run. There are, there are folkways, there are norms, there are practical laws on the ground. Well, well indeed, that's what, that's what we do. We, 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 uh, don't assume the crowd has been to Burning Man. Some of you might have. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to raise a hand, but uh, you might want to tell them a tiny bit about <laughs> well, it. Well, we, well, we, we build a, a temporary city in the desert. It has all the, uh, uh, it is everything any city, normal city would provide. It lasts for eight days. Um, uh, it's known, our, our event is known as, I, I've seen the literature around this event, the word radical keeps coming out. Uh, uh, it, it is kind of radical, but, but radical in both senses of that term. Uh, it's a, it, it, radical conventionally means you know, pushing boundaries, going beyond normal categories of thought. But it, 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 think about how it's used. It also means deeply rooted in the human soul and primal realities. It's very conservative meaning. <laughs> think, sorry, things that go deep. And, and, and don't change that are fixed. And we created a, 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 a kind of city that goes to uh, those two extremes at the same time. And if you go to two extremes at the same time, uh, it, 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 it broadens your view. You can, you can comprehend a greater subject. And uh, uh, so we, we have a, a, this roiling improvisation taking place, it, 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 ungoverned interactions, all of it unplanned. Uh, just as nature is unplanned. Um, well, but at the same time, at the center of it, you have a man, and it, have a man at the center, and the whole city's laid out like a Neolithic temple complex. And, and it, you can combine those things at the same time, this radical coherence and this radical freedom, then you can begin to do something. Like, then, then you can create an arc of meaning that, that's substantial. And, and, and Paul, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, we were talking backstage earlier, and um, I DJed some of the early Burning Man way back in the ancient late 90s. And one of the, the most uh, beautiful things, we were talking about art uh, backstage, um, and the idea of cultural capital. And I think the, um, considering we're in a, a, a context where we're looking at the economics of culture, um, one of the most beautiful things about the festival um, is that I think if you look at this idea of spontaneous order, um, complexity theory, um, there's a lot of simple things that go into that, like uh, creating complexity from very simple rules. And I think that, remember you were saying, don't call it a festival, call it a city. Um, That's want, the best descriptor, yeah. probably. Yeah. But um, then you had some other great ideas about the way um, cities kind of function about uh, networks. You want to riff on that for a second? Well, we have created institutions, or rather they created themselves, but then we, we, we act in, acted in aid of those and formalized it, made it more conscious for people, ways of building social capital. Uh, 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 one novel thing we did, of course, probably the most novel thing we did, is we said there's no commerce at our event, none. Well, that's kind of a that's kind of a heterodox economic model, certainly. But but uh, but what that did is it it, it, it and then we said Let, let's take it a, a step further, make it more positive, and say it's a gift ethic that, that that we're here to give things to one another, and gifts are by their nature unconditional. They're not based on you know exchange. They're based on simply Given things without expectation of return. In other words, they, they have an unconditional value. That's maybe not a term the economists 
deals with very often, but, you know, because that's all about objective measure of value, you know. But meaning in a society is, 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 is intrasubjective, and it's another creature altogether. There are, in fact, many economists now looking at the questions of happiness and meaning yep. and seeing what they can measure. There are, the country of Bhutan has tried to come up with the concept of gross national happiness and keep an eye on it. You might not know that much about Bhutan, but France has started to take the idea seriously of measuring things other than well, productivity. Well, and there's all this happiness research that's going on, yes. Yeah. And, and then you have a man like Daniel Pink who's saying, you can get better results from employees. This is in a business context, especially if it's a creative task. If, if instead of trying to pay, pay them higher salaries, you furnish them with three things, autonomy, mastery, and, and purpose. Yep. Meaning. And, 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 and that's called meaning. And, that's what, and we set up a city entirely for that purpose, to create yeah. meaning. But I mean, there's a really interesting uh, writer named Lewis Hyde uh, up at Harvard whose work is, inspires my work a lot. Um, and I'm very interested in this idea of the gift economy in general, because when I was first coming up as an artist, I give away DJ mixes all the time. Uh, I still do to this day. Um, in fact, everything on the stage is free. If you guys want to just take our shoes or anything, you know, feel free. Uh, <laughs> but um, the fun part about DJ culture and sampling is that it's about the interplay of memory and who owns memory. You know, this is something that um, I think as we move further into the 21st century, intangible goods are going to be something that people are trying to figure out because it's very difficult to quantify culture. Um, it's very difficult to quantify the value of these kinds of things. But burning them by the gift economy, um, it's actually looking at our ancient models. I mean, we were talking about the gift economy in, in Indian culture or in the South Pacific. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in Vanuatu, which is a group of islands next to uh, Polynesia. And um, they are rated as one of the happiest places on Earth. Uh, but um, their economy uh, was over something like 90% unemployment. And, but unemployment in the South Pacific Island isn't, you know. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's different kinds of gifts as well. Let's uh, take some questions now from the audience. Put your hand up nice and clear where I can see it, because the stage lights can blind you. If you don't have a question, I promise I will come up with one. There's a gentleman down here. Wait, wait for the mic and, uh, so everyone in the back can hear you. It's just about to get there. Hi, I have a question for Larry. Um, what do you see now that you know, Burning Man's really becoming a major you know, cultural entity? Um, what's your vision for the future of Burning Man? Well, I think, we, we, I think where Burning Man is today is, is it started on a beach with about four people, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think where it is today in relation to the future as, as that beach was to Burning Man today, um, uh, which is to say we're ambitious. Uh, and we have reason to be, because we attract people from all over the world, and at the same time, people who fanned out from the event and founded communities all over the world. We have, we have entities it, 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 in, on every continent. And uh, so now we're, we want to turn around and, and, uh, and, and do various things. We, we want to, it, 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 we know the surest thing that, that, that transmits the values of our culture are these immersion experiences. And, and so we're looking at it practically, we want to multiply them you know, tenfold and then a hundred and, and, until they, they, they you know, girdle the globe. And, 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 and listen, our folks are starting to do that anyway. We're just going to help them to do it faster because we've been down the road and we can be consultants to them. And, and at the same time, we're going to build up our capacity at the center. And then it'll get interesting after that because people will go out and they'll have absorbed, this is a kind of cultural technology, they'll have absorbed an ethos and they find amazing, myriad ways to apply it. And when they begin to apply it with us, having learned to collaborate, having at, at Burning Man itself, then, then, then they will come back to us and, and, and then we'll just, we'll just help them to tend that garden. And, and, and then at that point, it will start to organize itself in ways that we can't imagine and, and we'll just, we, we'll be humble before, but what, which will serve. Uh, really what we're trying to do is, uh, is engineer a world uh, movement at yeah, the grassroots and on high at the same time. There's a gentleman with a question here, and if I can ask you to keep it brief so we can have a, maybe take another one. Oh. oh. Somewhere else. Yeah. That's all right. All right. Um, you mentioned that um, several of these movements like uh, Occupy um, Wall Street have fizzled out. Um, the biggest uh, crisis I think we're facing as humanity is climate change. What do you think 
um, uh, social movements can do to turn um, this around and, and make both corporations and governments um, really take action? Paul, I think that's yours. Yeah, um, I've been working with um, 350.org and Bill McKibben, who's a very, uh, I think, very compelling advocate for, um, he just did a tour called Do the Math. Um, if you haven't checked it out, just 350.org, very uh, easy to remember. But the whole idea is that I think um, these kinds of cultural initiatives help reframe the debate. Um, as we've seen with the last election, it's, it, with, with the, 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 the discussion wasn't about the numbers at all, it was about the emotional logic. Um, and with Sandy, you can't argue with the storm. You know, the storm will come and it will smash your house. You can't, you know, even if you're, you know, uh, you know Ann Coulter, it will smash your house. Sorry, you know. Um, so we have to really understand that um, this is more about internalizing science and making the science become part of the cultural vocabulary. Um, and I think the problem with the right wing uh, agenda, with this sort of hu huge cloud of disinformation, um, is that essentially people are very naive and the arts can help make and catalyze more of an emotional discussion because the numbers are already speaking. I mean, the, the, we've had record level droughts, we've had record level um, you know, firestorms, of course now storms, um, Colorado, Texas, it, the, the list goes on of places that have been hammered. And um, you know, you'd have to be an absolute fool or somebody like George Bush you know, to not process that, but you still, it's incredible. People, you still have to like point out, it's like, hi, your house is on fire, you know? And they're like, really? You know, anyway, that's, that's my take on it as a downtown DJ. Let's try to get one more brief, very short question in from the gentleman up here, I promise. And this will be the last question and the last answer. On the left, sir. Thank you. Uh, so part of what you said about the gift-giving economy, uh, anthropologist David Graeber wrote a book on gift-giving economy. He also wrote another book on, uh, titled The Ethnography of Direct Action, which touches on a little bit more of the sort of things that came up with Occupy Oakland. And we've seen with like the Tea Party or Occupy that it's sort of moved from an, an active to a very reactive uh, standpoint. Uh, with social movements around the world in the coming year, do you see it, and maybe you can speak to it, uh, do you see it more going toward reaction and then fizzling out, or do you see this accelerating, the move from creative to a reactive force? Well, everything is reaction to something, right? We all came from some stream before us. Yeah, I don't, Jerry, do you wanna do that? I don't know, maybe Larry jump in there. Well, I'll go back to what I said at the podium. Uh, I, for one, of course, I'm a member of what's called the creative class, and I'm kind of bound to feel this way. I like this debt session we're in. I, I really like it, because it's forcing people <laughs> It's forcing people to think in longer time spans. Whereas during booms, and as a member, as a resident of San Francisco, I know all about booms. And, and uh, uh, people can't think beyond the next quarter, they can't think beyond the next day, they can't think, it, it, they, well, they can't think. And it's absolutely guaranteed <laughs> in a boom that no cre very little creative thinking will happen. They'll just want more versions of what they know to make more money. And it, and it narrows your, it, 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 it narrows your, the, the range of your mind is f the way fear does, actually, on the other end. And, and um, so, um, yeah, I hope, I, I, I hope it continues for a while. I, uh, uh, be, because if we, if, we, if we can't think beyond the next year or the next quarter or the next month, uh, uh, you won't do anything about global warming. We're living in a world where in which everything about our life is unsustainable. I mean, just ask yourself, do one thought experiment. What if everybody in China had two cars, a swimming pool, and a swimming pool? <laughs> what, what the, well, that's unsustainable. It's all unsustainable, folks. And the reason we can't make any political progress is we've got this cognitive dissonance. You know, a situation at the beginning of the debt session, they said, save your money and consume more at the same time. <laughs> Amazing. So it, 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 we, we've, got, it, we, we've got to get beyond an economy that's predicated on unlimited increasing amounts of consumption with, with no end in sight, because the end is in sight. So maybe if we have to cope with rude reality for a while longer, we'll get a little more intelligent. 
Well, and you know, on that note, um, I know we have to wrap up, but one of the things that really intrigues me uh, with these kinds of um, situations is that ideas are a very scarce resource, and we have to start thinking about maximizing and amplifying ideas. And I think that that is so incredible because the idea of possibility is so, I think, important to celebrate. And when I say possibility, um, if people say you can't do that and you can't do this and you, you can't think that, you know, if people like, um, you know, there's a whole semiology in work. If you're at the edge of language and you can't describe something, then you're at the end of your vocabulary. And I think we need to really rebuild a new kind of vocabulary um, about progress, about our role as a species on this planet, but above all, the fact that you're right. I mean, it's, it's it, the, if, the, if we don't do it, the planet will do it for us. I'll leave it at that. I mean, it would, I, I can imagine uh, the near future where there's a tremendous amount of upheaval. The US military used, considers weather as a weapon at, the, at this point. I'll leave it at that as well. Um, there's a lot of really intense stuff that's you know, El Nino, El Nino. I went to Antarctica a little while ago and just looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off over most of the ice. It was just melting, huge. Um, chunks of ice the size of England falling off. But you don't hear about that in the news. Um, so it's a pl real pleasure. I know we have to wrap thank up. So. <laughs> Paul and Larry, on that note, thank All you right. both very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.